In the chaotic world of middle school and high school, it's really no secret that young girls can be absolutely cruel to one another. For some girls who don't get along, jealousy, grudges, and some sort of perceived competition can serve as fuel to that fire. Now, while most of us have dealt with some form of bullying or mean girl cliques to some extent, it's unlikely that that type of behavior will escalate into any serious, dangerous crimes. However, that was not the case when one Kentucky middle schooler accepted an invitation from a group of older girls to hang out. Little did she know that that night would turn into a terrifying ordeal. And this is the story of 12-year-old Shanda Scharrer and how the actions of four teenage girls changed the lives of everybody forever. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. Shanda Renee Scharrer was born on June 6, 1979. She lived in a very cozy town called Pineville, Kentucky, which is located in Bell County. Now, Pineville has a population of only around 2,000 people, and it's one of the oldest towns in Kentucky. Shanda and her older sister Paige seemed to have a pretty typical upbringing, too. That was until the heartbreaking event of her parents' divorce. Afterward, Shanda's mother, who goes by Jackie, found love again and got remarried, and she and her ex-husband Steve did stay friendly and cordial for their two daughters. With her new husband, Jackie uprooted the girls by moving to the bustling city of Louisville, Kentucky, leaving behind their quiet little hometown. The shift from a tight-knit community to city life must have been a pretty jarring experience, but Shanda embraced the change. She immersed herself in activities like cheerleading, softball, and even volleyball at her new school, which really did showcase her natural athleticism and willingness to try new things. Shanda was also just a really sweet girl. She wanted to make new friends. She wanted to make people laugh. She just had a little bit of a glow about her. She also had that very close bond with her sister, even though they were seven years apart. Now, unfortunately, her mother Jackie's second marriage didn't last very long, and she went through another divorce in 1991. Following the separation, Jackie wanted to relocate once again. So she and the girls moved just over the Indiana border to a city called New Albany. Now, this new location would be closer to Shanda's father, Steve, who was living just 10 minutes away in Jeffersonville, Indiana. So Shanda's parents had shared custody, and during the week, she would stay with her mom. During the weekend, she would go and see her father. Now, after this other relocation, she began attending another new school called Hazelwood Middle School. And on weekends, Shanda would go stay with her father and his new wife, Sharon. Now, moving twice at such a young age and being the new girl in a middle school would be challenging for anyone, and it took Shanda a little bit of time to adjust. However, having a really good relationship with her mom, dad, and stepmom did provide her with a level of support. And also, being that kind, likable girl, that young girl she was, it really didn't take long for Shanda to get in the swing of things and start making some new friends at her new school. So one day, one of Shanda's new friends asked her for a favor— she wanted Shanda to return a ring to a boy that she had just broken up with. So Shanda agreed, and she went up to the boy and handed him this ring. However, the boy unexpectedly got really mad at her and accused Shanda of meddling in his business. So even though Shanda was just doing a favor for her new friend, another girl named Amanda Hevran, who happened to be the boy's cousin, was nearby as all of this was happening, and she overheard him becoming upset. So she ended up starting a fight with Shanda, and Shanda was forced to defend herself, causing both of them to get a week's worth of detention. Now, funny enough, while spending so much time together in detention, they actually ended up becoming pretty good friends, kind of like a breakfast club type situation. It was a pretty strange way of meeting, and Amanda was two years older than Shanda, but they just seemed to click, and so they started even hanging out outside of school as well. While it was great that Shanda was now making friends, Jackie wasn't really that thrilled about Amanda, who had gotten her daughter in trouble at school for starting that fight. Shanda tried to reassure her by telling her that Amanda wasn't usually that way, and she had just been sticking up for her cousin. Shanda's dad and stepmom also had met Amanda a few times, and while she tried to be polite, they did kind of find her to kind of give off this, like, smug little attitude. So the parents weren't exactly thrilled about this new friendship that was forming. As the girls spent more time together, Jackie started to feel like Shanda was also acting a little bit different. 
According to Jackie, Shanda always wanted to look her best and would usually get up early to start primping for school, start to get herself ready. She would pick out her clothing the night before so that she would also have plenty of time to fix her hair and makeup. But all of that had seemed to change after she started spending more time with Amanda, who was the absolute polar opposite of a girly girl. So instead of her usual put-together outfits, she started wearing baggy clothing. Her grades also began dropping, including in P.E., even though Shanda was, remember, a very talented athlete. It also seemed like she was becoming more introverted and more emotional. So something just seemed off, and Jackie was very concerned. Now, it could have been just a typical preteen phase, but as a mom, she felt like something more was going on. Ultimately, Jackie's intuition was spot on. Shanda and Amanda did not have a typical friendship, so to say. Like most of us did at that age, Shanda and Amanda passed notes back and forth to each other constantly. But after a while, those notes started to seem to take on a more romantic tone. So Amanda had been in relationships with other girls before and had actually been dating a 16-year-old girl named Melinda Loveless right when Amanda and Shanda first started becoming friends. Now, when it started to become obvious that there was more to this friendship and that there was some sort of attraction or feelings between them, her girlfriend Melinda was not happy. She ultimately went on to start dating somebody else, but she was still definitely not a fan of Shanda because to her, that was the person who disrupted her relationship. Now, it's important to remember that during this time, Shanda was only 12 years old. Amanda was 14 years old, but their notes indicated that they had actually been physically intimate with each other as well. Amanda even took Shanda as her date to a school dance, and it was there that Melinda, the ex, saw the two of them together, and she became furiously jealous. Now, I guess fighting was a common occurrence at that school, because Melinda attempted to fight Shanda before Amanda was finally able to intervene. Now, even though Amanda was the one who owed her loyalty and she started dating someone else anyway, Melinda still had this furious anger directed solely toward Shanda. Later, when Melinda saw Amanda and Shanda show up together to an October fall festival, she became so angry that she actually started making threats towards Shanda. She told numerous people that she wanted to kill Shanda for spending time with Amanda, and she even said this to Amanda's face as well. Now, it may seem crazy for someone to put so much importance on a middle or high school relationship, but Melinda clearly had very strong feelings toward Amanda and almost seemed kind of possessive over her. Melinda had an incredibly chaotic and disturbing childhood as well, and some of the things that took place at home might help explain why she felt so hurt by Amanda moving on. The dysfunction was primarily due to the actions of her father, Larry Loveless. You see, after returning from his service in the Vietnam War, Larry's behavior became very erratic, to put it lightly. He had a hard time keeping a job, which put a lot of stress on Melinda's mother, Marjorie. Larry also tried to convince Marjorie to participate in swinger orgies, but when she refused, he had forced her to do it anyway. So this and other forms of sexual harm and physical harm ultimately led Marjorie trying to take her own life on several occasions. His harmful behavior wasn't only directed at Marjorie, though. He also sexually harmed Melinda's older sisters, his niece, and his sister-in-law. A true creep. He also creepily slept in the same bed as Melinda until she was 14 years old. However, she hadn't elaborated on what may or may not have taken place during that time. However, even if nothing did happen physically with his daughter, he thought that it was funny to openly smell his daughter's underwear in front of the entire family. So it's not hard to imagine him doing other creepy things while sleeping in bed next to Melinda. Just a true, foul, disgusting human being. He also had a horrible spending habit, to the point where there was often not enough money for food. The kids were often hungry, and they even had to file for bankruptcy because of this. A breaking point came in Melinda's family after Marjorie caught Larry attempting to spy on Melinda and her friend. Now, this led to a violent altercation and another attempt by Marjorie to take her own life. So Larry ended up filing for divorce, leaving Indiana, and cutting off all contact with Melinda and the rest of the family. So with so much trauma and chaos at home, it's easy to see why Melinda would want to have control over anything in her life that she possibly could, and also why she would have abandonment issues. It's unclear how long Shanda and Amanda were romantically involved, but at some point, her mother Jackie found the love letters between them, and she became extremely concerned about her 12-year-old daughter being involved in a physical, intimate relationship. 
She didn't care about Shanda's sexual preference, but she did care that she was getting romantically involved with someone two years older than her. Jackie felt that Shanda was way too young to fully understand her sexuality and definitely too young to be acting on it. She felt like the changes in Shanda were probably due to her not being physically or emotionally mature enough to handle such a serious relationship. When Jackie found out that Shanda had been refusing to dress for P.E., it seemed like she was becoming uncomfortable about people seeing her body. Now, this too could have been a result of Shanda engaging in activity that she wasn't emotionally prepared for and making her feel the need to conceal herself, maybe. So even though it was going to be very hard, Steve and Jackie decided together that it was in Shanda's best interest to once again switch her schools. So they withdrew her from Hazelwood, and they transferred her to a private Catholic school called Our Lady of Perpetual Help School, hoping that distancing Shanda from all the drama with Amanda and Melinda would help get her back to her old self, help get her back on track. So even though they were no longer attending the same school, Amanda and Shanda found ways to stay in touch. However, at only 12 years old, Shanda pretty quickly started to move on. Even though Amanda wanted to maintain their romantic relationship, Shanda was making new friends and even joined her new school's basketball team. So being with Amanda was just no longer Shanda's priority, and her parents were relieved to see that she was finally starting to act like her old self again. She started to enjoy picking out cute clothing for school again, getting ready for school. Her grades were improving as well. It was like this dark cloud that had been following Shanda around her and her family had finally been lifted and she was once again her bubbly, happy, vibrant self. She even started dating a boy that she met at school. But Shanda moving forward with her life wasn't easy for Amanda. Now, someone else invoking so much emotion from Amanda when they weren't even together only made Melinda more jealous, which was starting to evolve into an irrational hatred for Shanda. She even wrote notes to Amanda, telling her that she wished that Shanda was dead. It would seem like after Shanda had been away from Amanda for long enough that the drama between her and Melinda would dissipate. You would think that, right? And that seemed to be the case a little bit. That was until one day when Shanda got a knock at the door when she was staying at her dad's house. On Friday, January 10th, 1992, Shanda had been spending the weekend as usual with her dad. When she heard the knock on the door, Shanda opened to find two girls claiming to be the friends of Amanda. The girls were 15-year-olds, and they were named Tony Lawrence and Hope Rippey. And not long before knocking on Shanda's door, they had been getting ready to hang out with their childhood friend, Lori Tackett. Lori was 17 years old and the only friend in the group with a car, so she actually picked up Tony and Hope. She told them that they were also going to pick up another girl that she had just recently started hanging out with. That girl was Melinda Loveless. So Tony and Hope had never met Melinda, but she seemed nice enough at first when she got into the car. However, things took a really sudden dark turn when Melinda pulled out a knife and said that she wanted to kill a little girl named Shanda. Now that would have been the moment that I would have asked to be taken home or get the hell out of the car, or maybe even told Melinda to get out of the car. But I guess Hope and Tony thought that she was just joking when she said that she was going to teach this girl Shanda a lesson all for stealing her girlfriend. According to people who knew her, Lori Tackett had a dark side and a big fascination with witchcraft and the occult. This could have been in rebellion to her religious mother, who was an extremely strict Christian, but regardless, she had this fascination. Like Melinda, Lori's home life was tougher than most kids. Now, this wasn't because growing up in a religious home is inherently negative, but because Lori's mom took her beliefs to drastic and extreme levels. For example, when Lori's mom heard that her friend Hope's father had bought the girls a Ouija board, she went to their house and demanded that the board be burned and an exorcism performed on the entire house. Another incident occurred when Lori's mom found out that instead of wearing their religion's required skirts, Lori had actually been changing into jeans when she arrived at school. She became furious. Her mom became so furious that during an argument, she attempted to strangle her own daughter. Social workers actually had to intervene and regularly visit the house to ensure Lori's safety. However, even though there were people trying to assure that Lori's well-being was there, she ended up being harmed sexually on more than one occasion during her childhood and early teen years. Her intense religious upbringing led Lori to rebel in the worst possible ways. And not only did she become fascinated by the occult, she also started engaging in self-harm. When her parents discovered what she was doing to herself, she was admitted to a mental hospital. She was prescribed antidepressants and then released, but only a few days later, Lori cut her wrists again, 
this time much deeper, and she had to be rushed to the hospital. She was then admitted to the psychiatric ward, and she received a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and hallucinations. After going through more treatment, she was finally released again. However, within a year, Lori dropped out of school and began living with friends in Louisville and New Albany, Indiana. It was during this time that she met Melinda, and the two of them quickly formed a very close friendship. Lori talked to her about wanting to know what it felt like to kill someone, and considering Melinda wanted someone dead, their friendship made a very disturbing combination. We always talk about how these people find each other, and then it's like it just combusts once they meet. Well, that was about to be the case again. Neither Tony or Hope had any idea that Lori and Melinda had been seriously planning a murder. So Lori drove the group over to Shanda's dad's house in Jeffersonville, and Melinda convinced Hope and Tony to persuade her to come outside, come hang out. It was clear that the girls had no idea who Shanda was, because when she opened the door, they asked if Shanda was home, and that was her, opening the door herself. They told her that Amanda was hanging out nearby at a place called Mistletoe Hills, and that she wanted her to come hang out too. Mistletoe Hills is also known as the Witch's Castle, and it's a little stone house in Utica, Indiana, about 10 minutes away from Shanda's dad's house in Jeffersonville. There are local legends that a coven of witches used to live there until it was burned down, leaving only the ruins of the stone hut behind. Now, of course, being a very creepy abandoned building in the middle of nowhere and in the middle of the woods, it became a very popular place for teens to go and hang out. Now, it might seem kind of weird in this day and age for some girls to go knock on Shanda's door and ask her to come hang out, but you have to remember, this was in the 90s, and there weren't cell phones, there weren't cell phones to just call or text your friends, things like that, and... It was a lot more peaceful in that eight day and age to where you would just go knock on people's doors. So Shanda did feel a little hesitant about leaving the house, even if it was just to go hang out with Amanda, because she didn't have feelings for Amanda anymore, and had even told one of her new friends that Amanda was pressuring her to keep up with their relationship. Shanda told them that she had a party to go to, but that if they came back later, she could possibly go sneak out with them after her parents went to sleep. So Tony and Hope agreed to see her later, and then they left. While Shanda had been talking to the girls, Steve, her father, was inside and overheard small bits and pieces of the conversation. He, too, could tell that something was off about this interaction, and he got a little upset when he asked Shanda who they were. He felt like she wasn't telling them the truth when she said that they were just some friends. But Shanda once again assured him that they were no one to worry about, and eventually Steve and his wife went to bed. This left Shanda downstairs watching TV. Melinda was really angry that Shanda didn't come with them immediately, but Lori assured her that they would go get her later. In the meantime, the group went to a punk rock concert in Louisville. Now, I know teenagers had a little more freedom in the 90s, especially since there were no cell phones, there was nothing like that for parents to call their kids or track them, but it would be interesting to know what the parents of these girls thought that they were actually doing. So Hope and Tony actually ended up having sex with two strangers that they met at the concert. And it just seems like none of their parents had any idea of what was actually going on in their lives. After the concert, Lori drove Tony, Hope, and Melinda back to Shanda's house. During that ride, Melinda talked about how excited she was to hurt Shanda, but she said that the knife was really only meant to scare her. When they arrived, Tony decided not to approach the door, probably because she was disturbed by what Melinda had been threatening to do. That's my guess. So instead, Hope and Lori went to the house, and they invited Shanda to join them again. And this happened all while Melinda was hiding under a blanket in the back seat of the car. By that point, Shanda's parents were long asleep, so she decided to go with them. Now, it's not really clear if Shanda had actually planned on going anywhere or just wanted to sit in the car to talk, but either way, she ended up leaving her purse, wallet, and coat at home. Then, as soon as Shanda got into the car, Melinda attacked her. She was holding the knife to her throat so that she could not run away. Melinda interrogated Shanda about her relationship with Amanda while they made the 15-minute trip over to that witch's castle. When they arrived, Shanda started sobbing as they were dragging her out of the car toward that decrepit stone house. Then they tied her up with rope, began taunting her, and Melinda threatened to cut off all of Shanda's hair. Hope yanked off the watch that Shanda was wearing, which had a picture of Mickey Mouse on it and played a little song. Shanda having a Mickey Mouse watch is just another reminder of how young and innocent she truly was. And then the fact that the girls were mockingly dancing to the song as it was playing is a reminder of how evil and immature they were. So the inside of this dark abandoned house was scary enough. But to further terrorize Shanda, 
Lori lit a t-shirt on fire and told her that she was going to look like that shirt by the end of the night. Shanda then turned to Tony, who had really only been watching what the other girls were doing, and she begged her to help. Out of the whole group, Tony was the most passive and was honestly becoming a little afraid of Melinda herself. You see, at nine years old, Tony had been violated by a relative, and then again by an older boy at age 14. She went into therapy afterwards, but neither of her abusers ever faced any consequences, and she never fully dealt with that trauma. So as a result, she also began to self-harm, and even attempted to take her own life in eighth grade, which are things that most people her age wouldn't have been able to relate to at all. However, Lori did, and going through similar experiences made their friendship stronger. In their friendship, Lori was definitely more outgoing, and Tony always felt like she needed to impress her. She felt like if she intervened in what they were doing to Shanda, Lori would be upset, or maybe even turn on her. Even as an adult, I can't imagine how terrifying it would have been to essentially be being held captive by a girl who hates you and whose friends are clearly just as psychotic as she is. But unfortunately, Shanda's horrifying experience was far from over. The girls, or kidnappers I should say, started to become paranoid that someone would see their car and decide to come and investigate what was going on. So they decided to drag Shanda back to the car and relocate. Even though they discussed where they wanted to go next, they ended up getting lost twice, and then they had to stop at two different gas stations to ask for directions. All while they were doing this, they concealed Shanda with a blanket in the car and kept the engine running to muffle the sound of her cries. At one of the gas stations, Tony spoke to somebody she knew, but she chose not to mention that there was a 12-year-old girl being held against her will in the car. At the next gas station, Tony and Hope also briefly interacted with some boys before returning to the car. At both stops, they had the opportunity to reach out for help, to ask someone to intervene or inform someone about what was really happening. But instead, they did nothing. At some point, the ringleaders, Lori and Melinda, decided to give up on where they originally wanted to go, so they just headed back toward the direction of Lori's house, about an hour away. However, instead of pulling in her driveway, they drove past her house, and they went to a nearby wooded area. The whole night had been terrifying for Shanda, but it was nothing compared to what was about to come. After finding a secluded spot, Lori and Melinda yanked Shanda out of the car. Tony and Hope were starting to become scared of how the situation was escalating and didn't want to get out of the car at all. Melinda and Lori forced Shanda to then take off all of her clothes, and once again, they tied her up with ropes. Melinda then started punching and kneeing Shanda in the face, which led to her mouth being severely cut because of the braces she wore. Shanda was hurt, but up until that point, it wasn't anything that she couldn't have recovered from. That was until Melinda attempted to slit Shanda's throat with her knife. The blade ended up being too dull, though, so Lori and Melinda took turns stabbing Shanda's legs, feet, and chest. At some point, Hope got out of the car and held down Shanda's feet, making sure that she couldn't move while Lori and Melinda continued to stab her repeatedly. They then decided to tighten some leftover rope around Shanda's neck while Tony and Hope sat back and did nothing. Once they thought she was dead, they dragged Shanda back to the car and put her in the trunk before making their way back to Lori's house. When they arrived, the girls casually drank some soda and cleaned themselves up, almost as if they hadn't just tortured and killed a 12-year-old little girl. Even though Hope and Tony were allegedly scared, no one made any moves to call an adult or to get help. The girls proceeded to just hang out and act like normal teenagers. They gathered around for Lori to try to predict their futures using rune stones and tarot cards, and honestly, it's just really creepy how they were able to go from brutally assaulting someone to playing typical sleepover games that teenage girls do. However, once they were inside the house, they started to hear muffled screams coming from outside. Horrifically, Shanda was still alive inside the trunk of the car. So Lori ran outside and saw that Shanda's eyes were rolled back but she was unable to speak, but she was making noises. So Lori then used a paring knife to repeatedly stab Shanda again until she finally stopped making any sound. And the other girls were called Lori, returning to the house covered in blood. That's when she said they needed to go for a little ride. At around 2.30 a.m., Melinda and Lori left the house to go country cruising, which in the Midwest basically just means driving around a rural area. 
The only difference was that Melinda and Lori were cruising and they had a child who was on the verge of death in the trunk of their car. By some miracle, Shanda had survived everything that the girls had put her through, but she was starting to make gurgling noises again as she was using every last bit of strength to cling to life. When they had heard that she still hadn't given up, Lori pulled over so that Melinda could retrieve a tire iron from the trunk. She used it to hit Shanda repeatedly until, in her words, she felt her head cave in. And as if that were not enough, Melinda then used that tire iron to sexually violate Shanda. Melinda and Lori would later recall that they spent the next several hours driving around southern Indiana, intermittently stopping to assault and beat Shanda some more. After one of the violent assaults that took place, Lori got back in the car, laughed, and told Melinda to smell the blood as she held the tire iron under her nose. These girls are absolutely sick and deranged. Now, during this joyride, Hope and Tony stayed back at the house because they knew that Melinda and Lori probably wouldn't be returning with Shanda. At one point, Lori's dad came in to ask where his daughter was, and the girls told him that she was out with Melinda. Now, that would have been the third instance where Hope and Tony had a clear opportunity to get help or tell someone what was going on. But again, they chose to do nothing. Tony would later say that they considered getting help, but Hope told her that it was too late anyway. Melinda and Lori were undoubtedly the ringleaders in this, but Tony and Hope had been away from them for several hours at this point, and they could have done something. Instead of talking to Lori's dad or calling 911, they sat around while Melinda and Lori tortured an innocent girl. For Tony, it's kind of understandable that her trauma made her more of a passive and nervous person, and so she took Lori's lead, and while she knew what they were doing was wrong, she apparently was too afraid to stop it. Hope, on the other hand, had a pretty normal childhood. Yeah, her parents split up at one point, but they got back together, and she had never experienced anywhere near the level of trauma that Melinda, Lori, and even Tony had. At age 15, Hope started to self-harm as well, and her parents believed that she was being negatively influenced by Lori. They really didn't want her hanging out with Lori, but Tony had always been a good friend. It just doesn't make any sense why Hope wouldn't have tried to call someone during the five hours that she and Tony were alone at Lori's house. However, she would later show that she was more like Lori and Melinda than anyone originally thought. Just as the sun started coming up, Melinda and Lori returned to the house and woke up Hope and Tony, who seemingly had no issue going to sleep after everything that had happened. When Hope and Tony asked about Shanda, Melinda and Lori filled them in, all while callously laughing as if it was all just some big joke to them. They then brought Hope and Tony outside to see Shanda in the trunk, but Tony was so horrified that she refused to look. Hope, on the other hand, saw a bottle of Windex in the trunk, and she started spraying it on Shanda and her open wounds, all while cruelly saying, you're not looking so hot now, are you? I mean, the senseless cruelty is honestly sickening, and it's hard to even imagine someone being that evil toward a person that they don't even know. Shockingly, when Hope did this, Shanda actually attempted to sit up and was reportedly swaying back and forth. Now, it's not really clear if Lori's mom had been at work or in one of the deepest sleeps ever, but when she emerged, Lori and Melinda quickly slammed the trunk closed, hitting Shanda hard in the head. Her mom was clearly angry at Lori for being out all night and for bringing so many people over, so Lori told her mom that she was going to take her friends home. Unsurprisingly, she didn't take the girls' ride home, and instead, they headed to yet another gas station. There, they purchased a two-liter bottle of Pepsi, but instead of drinking it, they emptied the soda bottle, and they filled the bottle with gasoline. Lori then proceeded to drive north to make one more stop. When Shanda's dad Steve and his wife woke up the next morning, they were surprised when they realized that Shanda wasn't in the house. Her coat and purse were still there, and the door was actually cracked open. But Shanda was nowhere to be found. So Steve decided to call around to some of her friends, but none of them had seen or heard from Shanda. He started to become extremely worried and eventually decided to call Jackie to tell her that he didn't know where their daughter was. So Jackie then called and left messages for some of Shanda's friends too, but after not being able to find her the entire morning, they both started to panic. At around 1.45 p.m. on Saturday, January 11th, Shanda's parents called the police to report her as missing. After Melinda and Lori dropped the other two girls off at Hope's house, it seemed like, for Tony at least, guilt was starting to set in. 
She convinced Hope that they should tell their parents what happened. And Hope probably felt like if she didn't, Tony was going to tell them anyways, and it would look even worse. So Hope's parents drove with the girls over to Tony's house. And when Tony said that she had a confession, her father's first thought was that she was pregnant. However, the truth was far worse than that. And for the first time in this entire situation, someone finally decided to do the right thing. Tony's parents said that they were bringing their daughter to the police station, but Hope's parents decided that they were going to speak to a lawyer instead. The Jefferson County Police Station was already extremely busy by the time Tony and her parents arrived. The county sheriff named Richard Shipley was consumed by a new murder investigation, and it was complete chaos as they were trying to identify the victim. You see, earlier that morning, two brothers had set off to go quail hunting in a nearby area called the Jefferson Ground. Located in Madison, Indiana, the Jefferson Ground, or JPG, used to be an old military firing range and also a weapons test site, but it's now a wildlife park and a popular hunting ground. So as the brothers set out for their day of hunting, they made a shocking and gruesome discovery. Laying in a field just off the side of the road, they stumbled upon the charred remains of a human body. The top half of the body was badly burned, the hands were clenched in a fist, and the arms were stretched out in front of what is known as a pugilistic pose. Burn victims are often seen in this pose due to fire shrinking the body's soft tissues, causing the muscles and joints to flex and contract. The victim's teeth were clenched around their tongue, and their legs seemed to have been posed in an open position. It was a gruesome sight that shocked even the investigators who were called to the scene. A deputy from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office named Randy Spry was the first to arrive. It had been three years since there had been a murder in Jefferson, but as soon as Deputy Spry saw the charred body, he could immediately see that this was no accident. He knew that this wasn't going to be a routine case, so he called Sheriff Shipley and also the Indiana State Police to aid in this investigation. When more officials arrived, they began to photograph, videotape, and collect any evidence they could find at the scene. You see, things like this didn't typically happen in Madison, which led them to speculate that a possible drug deal between people from another area had maybe gone bad. It was suspected that these outsiders had brought the body to the field to set it on fire and conceal the victim's identity. The investigation into the burn victim was in full force when Tony and her parents arrived at the station. Sheriff Shipley overheard that she had information about a murder in Jefferson, and he immediately wanted to hear what she had to say. Tony appeared to be hysterical, and her story was a little hard for the sheriff to follow, but she did her best to explain what had happened the night before. She told him about how they tricked Shanda to come with them to the witch's castle, how Melinda and Lori had beaten and tortured her, and what happened after they filled that Pepsi bottle with gasoline. According to Tony, Lori drove the group north of Madison just past that shooting field and ground and then pulled into an unpaved gravel street called Lemon Road. Tony again refused to get out of the car, so the other three girls opened the trunk, wrapped Shanda's bloodied body in a blanket, and took her a few steps into a field right next to the road. Shanda was incredibly still clinging to life. Hope grabbed the Pepsi bottle and began pouring the gasoline all over Shanda. Seconds later, Lori struck a match and threw it at her, immediately engulfing her in flames. The girls jumped in the car and started to drive away, but as Tony looked back, she saw Shanda trying to get up. Now, I don't know about you, but I've only heard of someone not only surviving multiple beatings, stabbings, and choking, like once in my life, but then also having the strength to try to stand up while on fire, that is something I have never heard. However, Melinda was so determined to make sure that Shanda had no chance at survival, and she started to feel paranoid that the fire would go out. So Melinda told Lori to turn back around, and she got out of the car and poured the rest of the gasoline on Shanda and lit her on fire again. She stood there for a minute, watching as Shanda's body made its last involuntary movements before jumping back in the car. After abandoning Shanda, the group went to McDonald's for breakfast, where Lori actually had the audacity to joke about their sausage looking like Shanda's burned body. So absolutely sickening. Sheriff Shipley had barely finished writing down Tony's disturbing statement when he got a report about a missing girl named Shanda from nearby Clark County. He immediately felt sick when he realized that that missing girl was the same one from Tony's statement and seemed to match the attributes of the badly burned body that they had located earlier. Dental records soon confirmed that the victim was 12-year-old Shanda Scharer. Sheriff Shipley filed the paperwork for warrants to arrest the girls that Tony had named in her confession. 
However, before they were obtained, he had to inform Shanda's family of the heartbreaking news. Now, as you can imagine, they were absolutely devastated beyond words. Even though Tony and Hope decided to tell their parents and Tony had talked to the police, they weren't the only ones talking about the crime. After Lori dropped Hope and Tony off at home, she and Melinda headed back to her house. And Melinda tried telling her friend Crystal and even Amanda about what they did to Shanda, but neither of them believed it. Amanda probably just thought that Melinda was just trying to upset her or maybe even impress her, but Melinda said that she would show her the proof. Crystal came over and then she, Lori, and Melinda went and picked up Amanda and brought her back to Lori's house. They then showed the girls the trunk, which was covered in Shanda's blood. There were bloody handprints, a pair of Shanda socks, and Amanda realized in that moment that they were not joking. She reportedly started to feel sick and asked to be taken home immediately. Lori and Melinda dropped her off, but before she walked away, Melinda gave Amanda a kiss and told her that she loved her and begged her not to tell anyone. Amanda promised that she wouldn't, before finally going back inside. Soon after Tony's confession, Hope came in and corroborated her story. That was before all four girls were arrested for their involvement in Shanda's murder. It was determined during her autopsy that her official cause of death was smoke inhalation, which proved that she had been alive when she was set on fire. Now, even though they were all between the ages of 15 and 17 years old, and due to the heinous nature of their crimes, all four of them were charged as adults. In exchange for her cooperation and agreeing to testify against the other three, Tony was only charged with criminal confinement. Melinda, Hope, and Lori were all charged with murder, arson, battery with a deadly weapon, aggravated battery, criminal confinement, and intimidation. Melinda and Lori also ended up receiving seven additional charges pertaining to sexually violating a child. In the early 90s, the girls could have been deemed eligible for the death penalty, so they opted to accept plea bargains instead of risking that possibility during the trial. During sentencing, each girl's defense presented experiences from their childhood as mitigating factors. They had all dealt with trauma to some extent, and the defense used these facts and their young ages to plead for leniency from the court. During their sentencing hearings, Tony, Hope, and Melinda read statements apologizing to Shanda's family and trying to express guilt and remorse for their actions. There were lots of tears, theatrics, and excuses, but the Shara family wasn't having any of it. Her mother, Jackie, became the spokesperson for the family, and she attended and testified on behalf of Shanda during all of the sentencing hearings. And I have absolutely nothing but respect for the unbelievable amounts of strength and courage that Jackie had during this time, because she had to stand in front of the people that murdered her child, and she had to hear the details of what happened to Shanda over and over again. She also had to listen to these girls make excuses and try to explain why they didn't deserve to die in jail. Jackie prepared a video with photos of Shanda throughout her short life, and she also read a statement that lasted 45 minutes. She talked about what kind of person Shanda was and all the things that she could have been had she been given the opportunity to live. At Hope's hearing, she lowered her head during the video, and this infuriated Jackie and also the judge, so the judge ordered Hope to look up and watch. Tony Lawrence pled guilty to her charge of criminal confinement. During the hearing, Tony made a statement which said, I do feel very much remorse for your daughter. I've been locked up for 10 months, and that time has been a living hell. I've had nightmares when I wake up screaming, and I can't stop to think for a second without seeing Shanda's burned body or hearing her screams. I was terrified of Melinda and Lori. Melinda had a knife and was going to kill Shanda. I know I should be punished, but in my heart, seeing Shanda tortured and burnt was punishment in itself. I didn't get help because I was scared that they would kill me too. Tony was ultimately sentenced to a maximum term of 20 years. Hope pled guilty to a criminal confinement, arson, and murder, and she was sentenced to 60 years, with 10 years suspended due to mitigating factors and 10 years of medium supervision. However, instead of just serving her sentence and taking responsibility for her actions, Hope and her lawyers tried everything they could to get a lower sentence. After an appeal, it was lowered to 35 years with five additional years of supervision. Melinda and Lori, who were definitely the masterminds and Shanda's primary torturers, pled guilty to murder, criminal confinement, and arson. Jackie held Melinda the most responsible and described her as being pure evil, regardless of her bad childhood. During Jackie's statement at Melinda's hearing, she said, Melinda has cheated me out of being with my daughter during this life. 
It is my wish for you, Melinda, that you live your life with memories of her screams and the sight of her burned and mutilated body. I'm not sure who you love most in life, Melinda, whether it be your mother or your father, but I want you to imagine them in the trunk of that car. I want you to imagine the person you love the most begging and screaming for their life. I want you to imagine that person being the person lying on the ground who was burned and mutilated. Maybe then, and I doubt this seriously, that you could feel a small portion of the pain our family feels. The proper punishment for Melinda would be to place her in the cell with pictures of Shanda's burned body and force her to continually listen to a tape of my daughter screaming like she did that night. I hope and pray you remember these words for the rest of your life. May you rot in hell. Melinda and Lori were each sentenced to 60 years in prison. And Shanda ended up not being the only casualty as a result of this horrific crime. Her father, Steve, was never able to fully recover after Shanda's murder, and the immense grief and guilt of not being able to save her led him to seek comfort in alcohol. And Steve tragically passed away in 2005 at the age of 53 as a result of alcoholism. Jackie was able to feel some relief in justice when all four girls were behind bars, and all she wanted was for them to take responsibility and serve their full sentences. However, like Hope, Melinda's lawyer launched an appeal in 2007, arguing that Melinda's traumatic childhood affected her judgment, and that there were various technicalities that should have affected the sentence. Jackie was furious and spoke out against Melinda's appeal and promised to fight to keep her in jail. There was even a petition started by members of the community who believed that Melinda should serve her full sentence. Even though her appeal was denied, none of the girls ended up serving their full sentences, though. And this is where we will get into one of the most controversial and infuriating parts of this story, and also the reason why many people believe that justice has not actually been served. Tony ended up being released on December 14, 2000, after serving nine years of her 20-year sentence. Her supervision ended in 2002, so she is now living free and unsupervised. Hope was released on April 26, 2006, after serving just 14 years, and her supervision ended in 2011, so she is now living free and unsupervised. Lori was released on January 11, 2018, and she was released exactly 26 years to the day after Shanda's murder, and she was on parole for one year, but she is now living free and unsupervised. And finally, Melinda Loveless. She was released on September 5, 2019. She is currently still on parole, but she is out living in the world, which is something that Shanda will never be able to do again. Despite being sentenced to prison for up to 60 years, all four of Shanda's murderers were released in less than 30. Whenever Jackie and Paige have spoken about Shanda's killers, you can tell how much pain they still feel and how angry they are about them being out and free. They did an interview together with Dr. Phil in 2011, and they had a chance to confront Hope, who had already been released. Dr. Phil, Paige, and Jackie all demanded explanations from Hope, but Hope just said that she didn't have any answers, other than she was young and she was scared. It still didn't seem like she had been able to take full responsibility, and she tries to come off as just a bystander, not an active participant. Now, I would have liked to see Dr. Phil ask her what was going through her mind when she was spraying Shanda with Windex when no one asked her to do it, and also why she held down Shanda's feet during the stabbing when nobody asked her to do it. But I think her answers would have been the same. She poured the gasoline too, which in my opinion makes her just as bad as Melinda and Lori. In addition to talking to Hope, Jackie and Paige also had a chance to watch Dr. Phil's interview with Amanda. Amanda was never charged or considered to be directly involved in Shanda's murder, but she definitely had a role to play in what happened to her. She claimed to have turned those notes from Melinda threatening to kill Shanda into a teen prosecutor, but I don't think that anyone actually believes that. I think that she liked the drama of Melinda being jealous and having girls fight over her. She could have actually told an adult the things that Melinda was threatening, but she didn't. Even after Melinda and Lori said that they killed her and showed her the evidence, she still didn't tell anyone. So for someone who claimed to have loved Shanda, she sure didn't act concerned for her at all. In the interview with Dr. Phil, Amanda didn't show any emotion at all about the situation, and it's easy to see why Shanda's parents thought that she was rude and smug. After Shanda's murder and hearings, Jackie was sure that Melinda was a remorseless monster, and she had no interest in ever seeing or hearing about any of her daughter's murderers again. However, in 2012, she was able to find some peace after Melinda participated in an interview to discuss training service dogs in prison. 
Now, this next clip is a little long, but I think it captures the strength of Jackie and the chance of redemption that Melinda has been given, even if she doesn't deserve it. Melinda Lovelace has a leash in each hand and a new lease on life as a trainer of service dogs for the disabled. She happy to see me. Huh? In seven years, Melinda has become one of the most trusted and competent trainers. Ian talking about dog language, yeah. let him figure it out. In the ICANN program. So we bring our challenges many times to Melinda because she's able to figure out what their strength is. Now you're going to the shoulder. Melinda has groomed Odal. Shoulder, you can just watch your little hand. As a courtroom dog for abused and traumatized children. Odal comes in. And he's going to sit with them, and they're going to hug him, and they're going to talk to him to make it easier for them. They're going to have that. But it's this dog, Angel, that is a dog like no other. A four-legged conduit to her victim Shanda's mother. And it just, you know, it was like a knife went through my heart. 125 miles away, Shanda's mother, Jackie, still endures shockwaves from her daughter's brutal murder. I had many times said that if you want to see as close to a person that has absolutely nothing inside of them, look in Melinda's eyes because there's nothing there. Jackie never wanted contact with any of her daughter's killers. You know, all I've ever said is I just wanted to serve their sentence. That's all I've ever said. I know what happened. Yeah. And but a breeder who supplies dogs to the ICANN program at the prison forged an unexpected connection. I liked it because it wasn't planned. I needed to talk to you. I'm Charlie Patrizzo, a burn victim like Shanda, convinced Jackie to watch a videotape of the new Melinda. I was really taken back. I could never, ever imagine having my own child and something happening. Um, I saw someone who um, was almost reborn. These are my babies. Someone who has learned to nurture something. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Love it. Then let it go. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. As Melinda did with Odal last March. I know he's in good hands. And when you have to pass off something that you have grown to love, it's bittersweet. There's growth in that. Yes, because... I've loved her, I've cried on her, I've given her her medicine, her bath, she's like my, my kid. She was compassionate. I think the ICANN program allows her to have something in her life that shows her unconditional love, that she can show that love back to, and there's a result. And there's never any betrayal on either side. Look at him. So Jackie Vaught did something remarkable. She took up Charlie, the breeder, on his idea to donate a puppy in Shanda's honor and let Melinda Lovelace train her. When you found out, she said yes. Yeah. What? Um, I, you know what? I didn't believe it. <laughs> Not until the puppy, Angel, ran into her arms the first time they met in a crowd of people. What are you even doing? Huh? That's the one Jackie had touched, had held, had named, and I said, um, wow. Jackie has faced criticism over her decision to let Shanda's killer honor her name. Good job. But if you don't let good things come from bad things, then nothing ever gets better. And I know that's what my child would want. My child would want this. She helped me to actually um, heal, forgive, and grow. Rather, she wanted that or not, um, she did a good thing. And I would thank her. Couldn't thank her enough. Melinda is training Angel to help someone in need. But Angel is already helping her. Angel is in good hands. And I'm doing it for Shanda. And I'm doing it for her. Yeah. The death of Shanda Shara was one of the most brutal examples of cruelty that I have ever covered. And the fact that it was inflicted on her by other children makes it even that much more disturbing. The ultimate mean girl's story. Shanda had a very bright future and in no way deserved anything that happened to her. And I'd really like to know what you guys think about this case. Do you think that the girls should have been released or should they have been made to serve their full sentences? Some people even think that they should have been given a life in prison, and I definitely can understand why they feel that way.
However, there are other people who believe that the trauma some of the girls endured made them lash out in one of the most violent ways possible, and that they should have been given more extensive mental health treatment. Regardless, all of them are out in the world at this point, so all we can hope for now is that they have learned from what they have done, and hopefully have become better people. Hopefully by sharing Shanda's story, we can educate kids about healthy friendships and boundaries, and the horrible things that can result from peer pressure. Shanda's death shines a light on the importance of seeking help if someone is in a dangerous situation. Standing by and doing nothing rather than speaking up can be the difference between life and death. And Shanda Shar deserved someone to stand up for her. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to her story today. If you appreciated the case coverage, please give this video a like. And if you want to hear more true crime cases on this channel, make sure you subscribe by hitting that subscribe button below. Thanks for tuning in. And until the next case, stay safe.